Hi, today I'm going to be talking about back saws. I've got a range of back saws on the bench in front of me, so let's take a little look. Back saws get their name from the fact that they have a spine on the back of the blade, and that is there to stiffen up the blade so that the saw plate needn't be as thick as it would otherwise need to be. That stops flexing of the plate and does mean that if you're following two lines in your cut, two straight lines, you should end up with a flat surface. Now this is still flex in one of these saw plates, but clearly that's a lot less than there would be on say a panel saw, where there's an awful lot of flex. Now it's quite a range in size from small dovetail saws through to the larger tenon saw. So I'll just take a little moment to talk you through those and then I'll show you how to use them. If we look purely at the um, length of the saw plate and the depth of cut, then these four saws would be classed as dovetail saws. Another important point is the number of teeth per inch. And whereas these three all have uh, 14 or 15 teeth per inch, this one only has 12. So in that respect, um, it should be classed as one of the other back saws. However, as I've said, the saw plate length and the depth of cut would also put it in the dovetail group. So these things are, are flexible, they're fluid. Uh, also with dovetail saws, you would generally have the open handle, like I have with these two. Uh, this one having a closed handle suggests that yes, it should be in the next group up, which would be the carcass saws. This little saw though is definitely a dovetail saw. It's only eight inches long. It's only got about two and a quarter inch depth of cut. And I don't know whether, this one's by Swan and Son, whether they just did dovetail handles that were uh, fully enclosed, or whether this one's been replaced at some point or other. Now although dovetail saws are used for making dovetails, they can be used for lots of other work as well. Uh, the name probably comes primarily from the fact that because they're small, uh, doing dovetails and that small sort of work is what they're generally used for. They can be used for tenons and they can be used for carcass work. It really depends entirely on the scale of what you're doing. So if we move up now to what is the carcass source. I've talked about this one being pretty much dovetail saw. In fact, this one is as well. Again, it's a 10 inch plate and it's got a small depth of cut. Uh, but they've both got the closed handles and I'm going to class them both as actually carcass saws. The teeth per inch, again, got 12 on here as well as, well as this one. Carcass saws, generally for doing carcass work, also come a little bit bigger. These ones are 12 inch plates slightly bigger depth of cut, about um, three and a quarter inches on these. That, for, that would be for doing things like housings in, uh, in carcass work. Moving up from that, we get to the tenon saws. So these three tenon saws, all pretty much the same. We've got a 14 inch plate, and we've got, on this one, three and a half inches, three and a half inches, about three and a quarter that end and three and a half here, so tapered. All pretty much the same. They're called tenon saws, and a lot of people think they're used for all the work to do with cutting a tenon. And of course, um, traditionally that's not the case. Traditionally they were used for cutting the shoulders on tenons and lots of other things. But they got their name from cutting the shoulders of tenons, and that was because they were cross-cut saws. So cutting the cheeks of tenons, you would want a rip saw. Generally speaking, you'd be using a rip panel saw. Now, when I tune up one of these, um, I'll be making it into a rip profile. So I'll have cross cut tenon saw and a rip cut tenon saw. And if you're looking at new saws these days, you do tend to get that option of having rip or cross cut. So that's my family of back saws. Let me just pick one of those and show you how I'd use it. 
So let me use this Diston tenon saw, 12 points per inch, um, it's got a 3.5 inch depth of cut and 14 inch plate. So very typical of tenon saw that you'd buy these days. Now I've just got a piece of 4x2 here, it's a piece of rough lumber, I'm just going to cut through it at 90 degrees, so I'm going to use a, a square. Because we're using a back saw, we're going to mark this with a marking knife. Nice deep knife line. We're going to use a chisel now just to pair towards that knife cut at a low angle. And you can see, just break that piece off, and we end up with a nice knife wall with a little slope into it. Hopefully you can see if I put my saw blade on that little ramp that we've created, if I pull it back it will slide down the ramp up against the knife wall. So to start the cut we just place the blade on the ramp, pull back lightly when we come up against the knife wall, pull back a bit more that gives a little curve there, which will be the start of the cut. If we were going to finish our work um, shooting the end using a plane and a shooting board, we might want to start part way up that ramp just to leave a bit behind. And then we just use a thumb to hold the saw from sliding all the way down. And again, we've established the start of the cut. Now I'll talk more about work holding in a future episode, but for the moment just be aware I'm using um, what's called a bench hook. Basically it's a support for the back of the work that I can clamp the work up against and the thrust of the saw forwards pushes against this fence on the back so it stops it going anywhere. Now to make the cut we've drawn back with the saw to establish a little curve. Then we can cut on the forward stroke. And every, time, every stroke we take as we're beginning the cut, we're increasing that curve, bringing it backwards across the work and gradually lowering the saw down to a horizontal position. Once we're horizontal, we just keep going until we get through to the other side. Now, of course, there are some other important points to note. In most cases, we'll want to be cutting square. So we'll want our saw to be up nice and square to the work. Um, two ways to organize that. One is you mark your work down the face here, and you can track that as you cut. That's not always the easiest thing to do. If you start going offline, uh, it's quite difficult to correct it. So you really want to be going square to begin with. And one of the things which is quite easy to do is to take a batten with a squared off end on it, hold it up against the knife wall, and then the saw can rest up against that and it can't go any further. And as long as we keep the saw against that, we know our cut's going to be plumb. Um, clearly that's just one extra thing to be thinking about. It's better to get into the practice of holding the saw in the right position. You can also use um, either, depending on how wide the work is, hold a thumb up towards the top of the plate or a finger up towards the top of the plate, set the saw square and then use that. I'll show you this way around. Use that as a reference against which to rest the saw plate against. But really, after a lot of practice, you'll, you'll get to know where, uh, where vertical is with the saw. And you won't need anything to help you hold it. The work's a long way onto the bench. I've got one foot slightly under the front here, the other foot back. 
the side of my body is just to the left hand side of the saw so that when I grab the saw my shoulder is in line with the saw plate as is my elbow as is, as is my wrist so now as I pull the saw back you'll see that my shoulder is rotating my elbow is flexing and my wrist stays nice and straight having to flex my wrist as well to try and keep the saw straight so if someone was standing behind the saw as I drew it back my wrist would have to flex as well so that's three different areas that are moving at the same time it becomes more difficult to control if you can lock your wrist keep your shoulder in line with the handle and the plate elbow again in line becomes much more natural. Now what am I doing with my hand? I could just about squeeze four fingers in here but it'd be uncomfortable and the reason it is uncomfortable is it's, it's intended for three fingers. So this first finger is not used in there. If you do grip with that finger maybe slip the, the little finger out, that index finger is your strongest finger and it's most likely to cause the saw to wander off one way or the other. It's best if you avoid using your index finger. So second, third and fourth fingers in the grip. It's a light grip. All the pressure for sawing comes off this pad at the base of your thumb. So these three fingers are just basically holding the handle up against that pad. My index finger, I normally point forward but it's not actually touching, certainly not with any force on the handle. So it doesn't have any uh, influence on where the saw is going. An alternative, especially if you're getting rid of binding in the work, is to wrap the front of it around the front of the handle here to help you pull the saw back on the return stroke. It doesn't tend to affect the, uh, the direction of the saw. But it's a light grip. So when I'm pulling back, there's you know, not much effort because I'm not cutting. Pushing forward, it's against the pad of my thumb. This finger not doing anything. How far do you push the saw through on every stroke? Well, because we're sawing horizontally, theoretically you could pull the saw right back to here on every stroke. But realistically, by the time the saw has come about this far, teeth at the, at the front of the saw is now full up with sawdust and so it can't cut effectively for the rest of the this area here. So realistically you pull the saw back to about here and I know that all the teeth are going to cut effectively through the cut. Going forwards again we don't need to go into the work. That last tooth can cut effectively for a little bit of distance, maybe an inch or so, and drop its sawdust as you pull it out. So, up to about here, all these teeth drop their sawdust out the front. These teeth are now full up with sawdust. As you pull them out, they'll drop their dust. All these are empty, it continues to be empty on the back stroke, fill up again on the front stroke. a bit of binding there. So what can we do to help that? Probably only because I've kept stopping during the cut and if you stop when you're cutting you slightly lose your geometry. But I'll just put a little bit of wax on the saw plate. And before I cut through I end up in my bench a bit of scrap underneath. Now I think
thing you can see, although where I started and I was showing you what I was doing, it's a little bit rough because I was stopping and starting. Once I'm into the cut, you can see it's nice and clean. It's not going to take very long with a plane to make that lovely and smooth as well. Now I talked about scale and here I'm moving on to a piece of hardwood. It's a lot smaller. I'm using what's actually a dovetail saw, although it's 10 inches, to cut what could be the shoulder of a tenon. dovetail saw, this one set up with a rip tooth profile on it, it still produced a lovely clean cut. So don't shackle yourself to dovetail saws purely for dovetails, tenon saws purely for tenons. Use the right size saw for the job. Sometimes you'll find that um, for little cuts like this, it doesn't matter if you've got a rip tooth profile, it's the size of saw makes it easier. And if you're cutting dovetails, and you, they're really big dovetails, well, go with a tenon saw. Preferably with a rip cut. Please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe. And follow me on social media for extra photos and videos from the workshop. Cheerio!